and this can be a tricky topic. Um, so I'll go over an example I think uh, I hope will be useful for you. And we'll probably have a few more examples of this just to make sure that we um, really nail this concept. A few things to remember, I think, when we're talking about interfaces is that interfaces is sort of the mechanism that Java uses to address our desire to have multiple inheritance. Okay? Would like to do that. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. The problem is, is that multiple inheritance would be very uh, confusing and difficult to implement. For example, we'll talk about the example that we're going to do today, coding, if I was going to draw a design for it. That we could do something like this. If you remember, we said last time that at a college there might be students Actually, let's, let's take a different example. Let's take the example of a bird, us wanting to make a bird a animal, a flying thing, and a thing with feathers. All right. Bird passes the is a test for all those things. So conceivably, any of those are a good candidate, or, or I won't say a good candidate. Either of those are candidates to be uh, superclasses for bird. And it would be great, we might think, to do something like this and have bird inherit from all of these classes. The problem is, is what if these classes each had attributes in common? A name attribute, a set name method, a get name method, um, get weight method. All these different methods that there could be a conflict for. All right? Which method would we use for get name? All right? Now, get name isn't that big of a deal, maybe, but, um, you know, calculate or, or, or give average weight. Well, the average weight for a bird and a flying thing might be different, all right? Um, if there were attributes in common, if one name was a certain number of characters and another name, uh, if one was a, if an ID number for it, one was a character, one was uh, a numeric, if they're ID number attributes, which one would you use? All these things just really complicate the issue because there could be conflicts. Which method do we use if there's methods in common? Which attributes do we use if there are attributes in common? How would constructors work? All those things just get to be a horrible pain when we have multiple inheritance. So here's what Java said. Java said you could only have single inheritance, which means that every class can only have at most one superclass. Now, you can have a chain where class A has class B for its superclass, class B has class C, class C has class D, and so on. But every class in that chain only has one direct superclass. So what, would we do, what we would do in a case like this is we'd pick the one that we thought was the strongest is a relationship, the most relevant to the problem that we were trying to solve. And my guess would be that for most applications, would have bird inherit from animal. But still, there might be cases for us to treat all feathered things the same in our application, or all things that fly the same. All right? Again, if we were doing test flights, um, we might have helicopters and and planes, and sometimes birds upon takeoff can be a hazard to planes. So we, we might want to consider anything that a plane could encounter while flying. So we might want to have a flying things <coughs> class. But we already determined we can't have multiple inheritance. So what we do is we create an interface. Now 
Now I realize this is sort of a far-fetched example, but I hope it gets the point across. You show an interface with a dashed line. And you'd probably mark something in the interface like this to indicate that it is an interface. Now a class can implement multiple interfaces, but it can only have one superclass. All right? So you pick the strongest is a relationship that's relevant, where we get the most bang for our buck, so to speak, where we have the most things in common, the most attributes and methods in common, especially methods. And we would make that the superclass. The interfaces then would be other relationships that exist, but they're not really as strong of that. Yet we can make them as interfaces because then we can treat everything that implements that interface the same way. Classes are said to implement an interface. So if I have an interface, the classes that use that interface are said to implement it. And it should probably go without saying, because I think I mentioned it before, but just to repeat, when we use the word interface, we're not talking about like a graphical user interface. We're talking like an interface like, for example, does, that, uh, does our camera have a, U, uh, a USB interface? A USB interface in that sense is think, thought of as a way to connect it to other things. Well, this is a way of connecting classes together. You know, does this class have an interface for feathered things or for flying things or whatever? All right? So with inheritance, remember, we get two bangs for our buck. And that is, number one, we get the ability to inherit code. The second thing that we get is polymorphism. Thinking back to our pizza example, we had uh, a sheet pizza that inherited from pizza. That passed the is a test. A sheet pizza is a pizza. All right. And we had certain functions that a sheet pizza had in common with a pizza. Now, we are able to benefit from that because all we have to do is define those, those methods, those functions, in the pizza class. Because sheet pizza inherited from pizza, we don't have to rewrite those functions. So that's a benefit of inheritance, is that you can define a function on a superclass and all the subclasses get it. In other words, whatever is defined in the superclass, the subclasses get for free without you doing any sort of work. You only need to code the differences. All right? You only need to code the differences. Um, so if there was something special about sheet pizza, which in our example, I don't know, the price of sheet pizzas was different or something like that. And there was, I think, an additional attribute, like what the crust was stuffed with or something like that. Then we would have to write the code just for those differences. Now the second benefit we saw was the case of polymorphism. Again, polymorphism meaning many forms. And the case where we saw that was when we added the different pizzas to our order. We could add a sheet pizza. We could add a regular pizza. All right? We made our array list to contain pizzas. So we had an array list of pizza. And we added to that array list the different pizzas, the sheet pizza and the regular pizza. When we loop through the pizza array list, though, when we called the method to calculate price, we got the appropriate um, method. So for a regular pizza, we got the regular pizza's calculate price method. For the sheet pizza, we got the sheet pizza's price method. So both were pizzas. Both were declared in an array list for pizza, yet calling one function actually got different functions in the actual object that was created. We got the sheet meat pizza function, if we call it for a sheet pizza that was created. We got a regular pizza if it was called on the regular pizza object. And that's really a big win. 
All right, inheritance is a, is a win, but the ability to treat certain things the same way is a, a big win. All right, let's think of, the, of an example of like on campus. On campus, we might want to send an email blast to everyone. All right, to all our organizations that we deal with both our vendors and our customers. In other words, the people that we buy stuff off of and the people that we supply services to. We might want to span, uh, send an email blast to all them. We might want to send the same email to all faculty, both full-time and adjunct. We might want to send to uh, all students, undergrads and graduate. So we might, want to, we might want to treat everyone as simply an email contact, all right? Even though, in our inheritance scheme, each of these classes live at different places. So the drawing we might have, in this case, would look something like this. By the way, with interfaces, we don't inherit code, but we do get the benefit of polymorphism. So I can create an interface, create an array list of interface, loop through that interface, call the send email function on each of the members, and regardless of the member, that send email function will get the correct email, regardless of how the format of the correct email, uh, of the correct email address for that particular entity is. So we're going to have a situation that looks like this. We're going to have, and we'll do some of this we might not do all of it, but we'll, we'll do some of it. And then we might polish more of it off. But we're going to have something like this. We're going to have a student class. It's going to be abstract. Because every student is either an undergrad or a grad student. These are going to be concrete. We also have employees. And for employees, we have staff, and we have faculty. All right? We could take that down to adjunct and full-time, but staff and faculty is enough. Then we have organizations, and there could be vendors, customers, and maybe others. So we have all these different inheritance schemes with all these different classes. But we want to treat them the same way in one respect. We want to treat them the same way in that we want to send an email to all of them. So we may create an e a send email class, all right, or a, an email class. There's going to be a send email method in here. So we'll call this an email contact class. And maybe this class has a send email method that's going to accept an email contact, a, a what? a subject line and the body of the email. So three strings. Now, ideally, we wouldn't want to write an email, send email to student, send email to faculty, send email to um, organization. Ideally, we would want just one email, send email function, right? And that send email function should take, all right, any kind of email contact. So what we're going to do is we're going to create an interface called, this will be our email class, I'm sorry. We're going to create an interface called email contact, and we're going to implement it on these different things. 
Now, I'm showing it that we're implementing it on the superclass. But actually, for employees, or actually for students, let's say, let's implement it on the undergrad and the graduate school level. Because I want to show, I want to demonstrate how you can implement it like anywhere in the inheritance structure. So I could implement it on the superclass, on the subclass. If we went further deep, we could implement on other subclasses down there. Now, what is an interface? You can think of an interface as being like an abstract class that only has abstract methods. All right? So we're not going to define any actual code for our methods. We're simply going to supply the signature of the methods. All right? Let's say in this case our email um, contact interface is going to have one method, get email address. It's going to be an interface. Interfaces have no attributes. They only have methods. And all their methods, by definition, are abstract. So we're going to have a get email address method. And it's going to return a string. All right. We have a public string, get email address. And that's going to return a string. And that string is going to be the email address of that person. All right. Now let's say the email address for each of these is set up by a couple different rules. All right. Let's say for undergrads, students have an ID number and a last name. Let's say the email address for undergrads is simply going to be their last name, their student number, at the name of our college, whatever it is. So that's their, that's their email address. That's the rule that they have for their email address. Every student gets assigned an email address, and that is the name of it. Let's say that grads have the same rule, except they have a dot grad at the end of it. Let's say any employee, their email address is simply their first initial and their last name at whatever the college is. And let's say our organizations simply have an attribute that's called email. Because it could be anything. It could be president at company.org, or sales rep at company.org, or anything like that. So the email address for an organization is simply going to be their, their attribute. This is important to note about interfaces. I could have different functions for doing, I could have different code, wildly different code, to implement the functions in the interface. So for example, for an undergrad, I'm going to take their last name, their student number, and concatenate it with at college.edu. For a graduate student, I'm going to take their first name, their student number, dot grad at collegename.edu. For employees, I'm going to take their first initial of their name, K 
concatenate with their last name and add at college.edu. And the organizations, I don't do any sort of calculation or manipulation of strings. They simply have an email address assigned. This is important to know when we're studying interfaces, is that each of the classes may have a totally different way of doing the thing that it has to do. And that's OK. Because all an interface says is you have this behavior associated with you. That's what an interface is. It's a contract. Whatever methods I define in the interface have to be defined in each class that implements that interface. Have to, def have to be defined in each class that implements that interface. And unless it's an abstract class, it has to be a concrete method. But the details of the method can be way different. Let's think, for example, if I was going to do the flying thing calculation. How, what's the maximum speed of an airplane? What would that depend on? I don't know. Are there any rocket scientists in here? All right. It would depend on what? It would depend on the kind of engine, the kind of fuel, and some other things that you could do a calculation of. Depending on the kind of engine, and the size of engine, and the number of engines, and the kind of fuel, you could probably come up with some calculation to say the maximum speed is such and such. What's the maximum speed for a, uh, a bird? Well, it would probably depend on the kind of bird, and the wingspan, and the weight, and the age, and so on of the bird. And if you were an ornithologist, maybe you could write some function that took characteristics of a bird and calculated its maximum speed. What's the maximum speed of a kite? Well, it would depend on how fast the wind was blowing and how big the surface area of the kite was, and so on and so on and so forth. The idea here is, is that when we declare something as implementing an interface, all we are saying is it has this behavior. It has to have this behavior. The interface is a contract. All right, you'll see that term a lot. I think the textbook uses it. The interface is a contract. And by that, it means that when you declare something as implementing an interface, you are promising that that class will have the code that corresponds to the code that was defined in the interface. All right, enough talking. Let's go and start making some of these. All right, so I'm going to start with a brand new. And we might get through this whole example today, or maybe we'll finish it up on uh, Wednesday. But I'm going to create a new folder for email. I'm going to start out creating a class. Go create my interface. So public interface, not public class, but public interface, email contact. All that we're going to have in here is signatures of methods. All right? We're not going to have any attributes. We're not going to have any constructors. We're not going to have any concrete functions. We are just going to have abstract functions. In this case, we're only going to have one. And that's not, too, that's not too uncommon, by the way. A lot of times when you're developing interfaces, it's not like there's dozens of behaviors that they have in common. There might only be a handful. All right. So in this case, our method that we put the signature in is public string get email address. All right. So that's the signature of our function. No code associated with it because we can't, we don't inherit code with an interface. So I'm going to save that as Java in my and we're going to call it email contact. All 
I'm going to go in, and even though this doesn't do anything yet, I'm going to compile it, right? Just to make sure I haven't made some dumb typo. Because I don't want to have a million errors when I finish this and compile it and realize I forgot 16 semicolons and spelled 12 things wrong and so on. As I do a little piece, I'm going to compile it. Even though it doesn't run yet, I'm just going to make sure I don't have any syntax errors or typos or anything like that. So I will go into that folder. I'm also going to do com uh, compilations just to sort of demonstrate and reinforce the rules of an interface. So, so far, so good. Well, I would hope that we'd be able to put in two lines of code without having uh, an error, but we did that. So now I'm going to create my first class, and I'm going to create my, um, let's see, I'm going to create my faculty, my employees class. And it's an abstract class. Why is it an abstract class? Because no one is merely an employee. You are either faculty or staff. All right? So there's no one that's just a generic employee. Every employee um, falls into one of three, one of two. Um, one of two, um, what would you say, categories. Actually, there's probably, in real life, there's probably a third, administration. All right, so administration, faculty, and, and staff would be the three categories. But everyone fits in one of them. No one is just an employee. All right, so I'm going to put some attributes on here. I'm going to keep them simple, and I'm going to create a... Uh, protected string first name protected right last name all right And I'm going to create a constructor here. I think that's all I need for them, right, as far as the email goes. There could be other attributes again. I'm only worried in this case about the stuff that is relevant for email. But I would have, you know, their social security number, their address, their phone number, and all those things. And I'm going to create a uh, constructor. Remember, we can have, in an abstract class, we can have concrete things. So we'll create a constructor that accepts two arguments, the two names, and simply sets the value of those attributes to the value of the arguments that get called. Now, we have to create our I'm going to say this. All right. Implements email contact. I'm going to save this, and I'm going to try to compile it, and I'm going to get an error.
I don't get an error. All right, interesting. I, uh, it makes sense now. I, it wasn't what I anticipated, but it does make sense. So I was expecting it to complain that I said it implemented the interface and it did not have a get email address method. Um, this class got a pass because it was an abstract class. The abstract class, if it was a concrete class, I would have gotten the error. So let's make a concrete class and let's get the error. So let's make a concrete class called faculty. And I don't need this attribute. And I need a constructor. But the constructor can simply call the superclasses constructor. All right. Now I'm going to save it. And I need to get rid of abstract. Thank you. All right. So now I'm going to compile it. And I did make, forget to make it extend. OK, so I get an error. This is the error I expected before, but it, it, I, I'm getting it now because I forgot abstract classes get a pass, right? Because you can't create an instance of an abstract class anyhow. So, if that method isn't implemented there, you know it's going to be implemented at some point. So what it's telling me is faculty is not abstract and does not override abstract method get employee address. Let's see why, what really that error is saying. We have this. We have our employee class. Okay. We have our employee class, which is abstract. Inherited from that is our faculty class. <coughs> this guy implements the email contact interface. The email contact interface has a method get email address. So when I compiled it before, when there was only these two, I didn't get the error because this is an abstract class. All right? Because it's an abstract class, it can't be instantiated. Therefore, there has to be something that comes below it. All right? There has to be a subclass that is going to be a concrete class that we can create an instance of. And therefore, the compiler isn't too concerned that this, email, uh, that this get email address doesn't exist here because this can't be instantiated anyhow. So I haven't broken my contract yet. I haven't created anything that I can make an instance of that doesn't have get email address. As soon as I make this, which is a concrete class, and I try to compile it, we've promised that in employee, and by the way, all of its subclasses are going to implement this email contact. That means that that 
get email address has to be defined either here or here. We haven't defined it here. We don't have to define it there, remember. We get a pass because it's an abstract class. But if it's not defined here, we have to define it here. Okay? So, where do we want to define this get email, given this being the rules? Where did I leave that? Given this being the rules, all employees have this format for their email address. So where should we declare that function? In employees or in each of the two subclasses? We can define it in employees. We can, we can define that in there, and that lets faculty and, um, what was the other one? Um, staff off the hook. All right. However, we don't have to declare it there because Again, it's an abstract class. We can't create an instance of it. So I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to declare in my employee class public string get email address What is the code to pull the first character? Because we want to pull the first initial. I don't know. Let's Google it. possible to only get the first character of a string. No, nope, we can put a man on the moon, but we can't get the first character of a string. All right, possible only get a first character of the string. String has a char at method, which returns a character at a specific position. And it starts at zero. So we could say char at zero, and that will give us the first character. So. I can say email equals f name char at zero plus l name plus at college dot edu. So that's our little formula, if you will, for calculating or determining the email address of a faculty person. So now can I compile it? You bet I can. All right? Notice that it doesn't matter that faculty doesn't have it. All right? Because we fulfilled that contract, we fulfilled that promise of saying that, hey, somewhere in this class, we are implementing the get email address method. So we can either do it in the superclass or we can do it in the subclass. The only exception of that is we get a pass if it's an abstract class. We can have the abstract class and not have the uh, method in there. All right, as long as it's inherited. So if there was a su if there was a subclass of faculty like adjunct faculty and full time faculty, again we wouldn't need to implement that function because that function is up in the superclasses. All right. So I'm going to go with student now. 
And I'm going to do the same thing. And I'm just going to do student and undergrad. So I have my student class, which implements email contact. I have my first name and last name. And I have my student number. Call ID. I'll create a constructor that accepts these three attributes. I can't put the public string get email address here because the different kinds of students have different rules for email. Right? We determine the email for a graduate student different than we do it for a regular student. OK. So I'm going to go and save this as student.java. And finally, public class undergrad, extend student, And arg ID, super arg ID. Yes. OK. Let's save this and compile it. Right. So I saved it and compiled it. We're going to have the same situation as we had before. We have an undergrad class, which is a concrete class, that nowhere up in its inheritance structure, nowhere in its superclasses, is it, or in itself, is there a method declared get email address. That is acceptable for the student class because it's abstract. That is not acceptable for the undergrad because the undergrad is not abstract. So what are we going to do? We're going to put in there the method to get the email address that is going to be simply the last name plus the ID plus at college.edu. And that compiles cleanly. Last thing we're going to do is we're going to create the graduate student again, keep in mind that the assumption here is there'd be more differences than just their email address. There'd be a lot of different properties and methods that this would have. All right, but we're just, for our case, since we're interested only in interfaces, that's the only one we're interested in. We said in this case it's going to be grad at college.edu. All right, 
and I'll save this as grad.java. I'll compile it. All right. OK. So now we have a couple classes anyhow that fully implement that. We don't have our whole class chart because we forgot the organization side of things, but we can, we can skip that for now. And I don't think, what else? We didn't do something else. We didn't do staff also. But still, we have uh, those things. Let's go and create our email class. Notice what I made the, the, the um, two. I didn't make it a string. I made it an email contact. All right? So I can declare a variable as being an interface. Now we know that we can't create an instance of an interface. So when we say email contact two, what that means is we have to give it an object that somewhere implements that interface. I think before I said we'd have strings. We're not going to have strings. We're going to have um, an email contact for that. We are going to have strings for the subject and a string for the body. We're going to have a constructor. And we are going to simply say 2 equals arg2. Subject equals arg subject. Body equals arg body. Then finally, we're going to have a public a send email method. And we're not actually going to send an email. We're going to lie, and we're going to pretend just by doing output. So we're going to do print out LNs. All right? So. Going to put a little line between emails to make it easier to read.
and it will simply output the two address, the subject, and the body. Now, we're already a little over, so I don't have time to write the test class. That's where we'll pick up on Wednesday. But what I would like you to do, or what I would like to do, is compile this, just to show you that everything we have is OK. We can define an attribute as being an interface. What that really means is an object that implements that. Yes? Oh, thank you. Oh, I don't want to do that. That will confuse it. Um, if you want, try writing a test class for this between now and Wednesday. That would actually be great. That may, well, I've got to think about this. But we will look at the test class, but I do want to uh, try compiling this before we go. Just to make sure when we start Wednesday, we start in with a clean compile. I added some parentheses here that shouldn't be here. All right, so everything I did was legal. Wednesday we'll consider the test class, and we'll write that. We'll show how it doesn't matter how the object is created. If it implements the interface, we know it has that method on it, and therefore we can come up with the email address however we want to. All right, we'll see you up in lab.